I made it. <laughs> you did make it. Then I was running up the stairs. It was an amazing experience. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our workshop today. My name is Dimitris, and I'm the founder of Goldanville, and this is my beautiful wife, Janet, which you've probably just met already, if you have another one already. And today, we are here to talk to you about what? Well, we are talking about agile world building still, except yesterday we talked about how to put down the foundations of your world, how to set the scene, and how not to let your world building get lost in all of those words. Today, we are talking about how you can take that from concept to table with session zeros, getting your players excited about your, uh, your game, and uh, making sure that you're continuing with these principles through session one, through session 50, through session 150. To if make you sure... ever do that, let me know because that would be awesome. I would like to see a session report for a session 150. That would be amazing. Uh, and of course, at its essence, we are all about world building only what you need only when you need it and really, really making sure that you're staying on track on message with your world so you don't get lost and cause yourself angst because nobody wants that. Nobody wants world builder's disease. I would like to say, first of all, that after we've done with that, we'll be going into the uh, material that you have presented, we have given to us from uh, your uh, homework. Yeah. And after we finish with that, we'll be getting questions. We'll be leaving quite some more space for questions today yeah so please if you have any questions during the whole of this talk about anything related to that talk just to be clear don't start talking about essentially we know space flight and spacex which are also but not relevant uh do let us know and i will be keep trying to keep track of all your questions and we'll be answering them as much as we can absolutely so we've got got some time guys we're gonna jump right into this we um with our first slide yes with our first with slide. Our first slide. Da! This is the Agile World Building Cycle. So folks who joined us yesterday will remember that the whole point of this is to build, as I said, only what you need, only when you need it. And yesterday we unpacked how to create the foundation for your world, how to create setting the scene for your world, which are parts of this process that you only need to do once. And you folks submitted some amazing work, which we'll be looking at later. Now, today, we're going to go into the circular part of this cycle. Now, this is the Agile world building cycle. We're going to talk about the play, which is when you're interacting with your players. You're playing your session, and we're going to unpack how to do that for session zero, and then how to do that for all the other sessions. Yeah. We're going to talk about how you can learn from your players and how you can learn from what you did. We're going to talk about the design phase, where you dream about what's going to happen next. And then we're going to talk about building. It paragraphs and sentences. Indeed. It's very important to say that for us, you are starting playing the game even from the foundation. So it comes very naturally that session zero for us is part of the cycle and it is the play part. For It is very important for you as a storyteller to not only create your own world, but to take into consideration what the place of their players are in this. But let's talk about it actually when we go to this. Absolutely. Yeah. So once you've created your foundation article and your scene article, you have a basic idea of what your world looks like. You know why you're building it. You know who lives there, a little bit about their history, a little bit about the main drama that is the current affairs of your world, things that are happening-ish. And you have some informations about, um, informations? Informations. You have some informations about, um, about the space that you've created. The next step, is to create a primer. So a world primer is a small document, not the Silmarillion, I cannot say this enough, which describes the basics of your world, and this is important, as seen by the players. So up until now, we've been talking about the world as you see it, as the game master. We've been talking about the so-called truth of the world. Yes, right? and necessarily the meta of the world, which exactly. is the foundation and the scene as we've created so far. Absolutely. And this document, the primer, is about how your players see the world. Um, it is the truth from their point of being. Absolutely. So think of it as an extended elevator pitch of your world, not an encyclopedia. You're expanding on those set the scene principles on the drama mm -hmm. to give some picture of the world, how it, how it looks to your players as they start the campaign. It should encapsulate the basic genre, the mood, the hook or unique selling point that we all defined in the uh, foundation stage. It should have the principles of your world as defined in the uh, setting the scene. So a little bit about the basic geography, 
a little bit about the sort of the basic stuff that is happening, yes. but no, no detailed articles. This is a one page document. And you have to understand that uh, effectively most of primaries will be read by the players before they start the campaign or in the very initial stages of it. It is important for you as a storyteller to make it engaging. If you give them, here you are, this is a tome you have to read, trust me, they will not. Yeah. Uh, in many cases, in fact, it's hard to get players to read the primer. So make sure that the primer is engaging, make sure that the primer has things that the players will need to know for them to jump into your world and feel like they are part of it. They don't have to become part of it. Exactly. It helps your players understand what kind of game they'll be playing. It gives them some basic information that they'll need to create characters and they'll need for the first few sessions. So let's talk about why the primer is important because you folks are looking at the screen thinking, oh, why would I do this? It's a great way to help players connect with your world from the get-go and get contextual understanding of the space that they're playing in. It's a great springboard. Is this like the form from yesterday, but the computer started to speak. We're all doomed. <laughs> it's a great way, springboard for them to start asking questions about your world. And you want this. When they ask questions, you don't necessarily have to answer them immediately, but it tells you what they're interested in, which tells you where they want to go and what they want to know. That is so valuable for you as a game master, creating a campaign that they're going to be engaged in. It works as a centralized hub for all the other important documents in your world. As you continue to build your world, you can add link in those things to the primer so you can find them always and uh, it helps you as a GM understand what information is available to the players when you look at the primer you know what the players know and that's really helpful because of course you have a meta document you have a pair of meta documents which are explaining the world in uh, from your eyes but looking back at the primer seeing the world again through their eyes is really really going to help you create engaging adventures so what should be included in this primer? As we said before, the major geographical information, if your world is a disc world, if your world has binary stars, this is the stuff that should be there. People will probably know it. Major events from the past, which are common knowledge. And uh, it's a nice space to put a timeline as well. Oh, most certainly. And also you have to consider what the players know. For example, if you play something like the game that we've seen in um, uh, uh, Dragon Meet the other day, um, uh, Nibiru. Yeah. In Nibiru, for example, the players start with completely no knowledge of the world around them, and that changes things. There is still going to be a primer because you still have to tell them that when you open your eyes, even if you don't remember anything, you see an environment around you. And putting this environment in the primer will start, the, will start them by opening their eyes and not having to get a massive exposition dump in game that will slow down the game. So the primer can be, as you said, Janet, from anything to be major geographic locations or the things that you know as you grow up, but it can be as small as effectively these are the 10 things that you need to know to start playing the game kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, I saw somebody asking in chat, this primer is not the same as the articles that you created yesterday as part of your homework. Cannot stress this enough, the meta information is for the game master. It's full of secrets and spoilers. The primer is what you give to your players to introduce them to your world. No spoilers, no secrets, just the big information that they need to know. Having a, a timeline of the biggest events that have happened in your world that people know about. This is the sort of common knowledge stuff. Um, yeah, essentially you can think about the fact that if the player is a 20 year old boy or girl, they have learned about the major wars that happened exactly. or what his grandma used to tell him if it's fantasy or what is written in the books if it's a modern world or if it's a, a essentially a futuristic world because yeah. you know everybody has some basic understanding of the world around them even if it's local or it's a global scale kind of event yeah absolutely so a small amount of information on the major events of the past a little bit of recent history, stuff your mom told you, stuff your grandma told you. This is the kind of stuff to add in the primer. And again, sentences or paragraphs, but usually sentences in the primer. Simple statements. A little bit of current affairs. Again, that will be the play of you of those drama points that you made in the foundation. Those five big things going on in the world, but this from the player's point of view. So it might be as rumor or as hearsay. And uh, finally, a little bit about the people. So a little bit about the major species, races, 
major cultures in your world. Just if there's a massive city that everyone's heard of, mention that in the primer. We're not talking tiny villages here. We're talking the big stuff. Yeah, like effectively in Pathfinder, we're talking about the five major cities. Like, you know, that this this is what they're talking about. Or for example, Waterdeep or Neverwinter, like the right. places that people know of. Right, we're talking Rome. We're not talking... Um, Kadokolopetinitsa. It right. is actually a name, means and, uh, lower bump side in Greece. Nice. Yes, it's actually true. We are not talking lower butt side, people. We are talking Rome, Rome significance. So that's what should go into your primer. This is a, such a useful document to give to your players. And again, sometimes when they ask questions, you can just, just share the primer again and say, hey folks, that's in the primer. And they can have a quick glance and they will remember. Um, and that's that's a really useful thing for you as a game master Thank as well. Thank you, remember. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you just got complimented on your Greek. Really? Yeah. Well, great, because I am Greek, that is. So once you have this primer document, you're ready for session zero, but you're not giving it to your players yet. Now, the reason for this is that there's an extra step. You want your players to come to your table super hyped about your campaign, so excited to play. And the trick to this is making them feel like part of the world is theirs. That's what the session zero is so good for. Enter session zero. Enter session zero. Nice slide. Um, so session zero helps you introduce the world to your players and it helps you start to build personal bonds between the players and the world through their characters. That's the trick here. So you work with them to create things that feel like they're theirs. Mm -hmm. You generate emotional attachments and that is the stuff of powerful and engaging storytelling. And I think that the trick there is, if it's possible to connect the major events of the world to the world's connected to, to, to the players themselves. So for example, uh, that's a very common example, but let's say that 15 years ago, there was a massive war. Your father could have been a veteran of that war or yeah. your uncle or the person who raised you, or you could be essentially the victim of that war. Be an orphan from the war. Exactly. Yeah. So consider how they are connected to this information and what can you give to its player that will make it their own? Because it's one thing to tell you 60 years ago, there was a massive war. And another thing to tell you 60 years ago, there was a massive war. This was the war that your grandfather mm -hmm. died and he left you this sword, which was the sword that he used in his regiment. Now you have a part of this history with you. You already feel part of the world. And there are thousands of things you can actually do to incorporate the history of your world in the history of your players. Absolutely, absolutely. And so that's, that's what we're setting up in the session zero. So how do you do that exactly? Well, we have a step-by-step -step guide for you. And uh, hopefully this will help you. Of course, in your own campaign, there will be bits and pieces that you want to add. Uh, there'll be important things that you need to weave in but this is the basics. Number one, use your primer to tell the story of your world to your player. You've created this document with the basic information from the player's point of view. Use that to tell the story, but do not show them the primer yet. There's a reason for this, I will tell you why. Invite the player to stop and ask you questions at any point during this explanation of the basics of your world. This is literally the once upon a time kind of period. Exactly, exactly. So the stuff you'll be uh, putting here will be um, all of the stuff that you throw into the primer, all of the stuff that we talked about, and hopefully it will be conveying the genre, the tone, the hook, unique selling point. So your player's starting to get excited about your world, right? Um, your player will ask questions. They are gold. They help you improve the primer and improve the clarity of the primer. This is so useful because when they're like, yeah, but what does that mean exactly? You know you need to clarify that sentence, which is fantastic. That's really good information. It also, as I said before, it helps you understand what the players are interested in. We all want to have our players running to the table. We want to have them begging for the next session. You do that by creating a world that they're engaged in, that they're curious about. And the stuff they're asking questions about is absolutely stuff that you can weave into the campaign that you can expand on. So that is gold information. And as per the um, agile world building method, when you're expanding on things, you're expanding on them, first of all, of course, in private, because you don't show them until it's time to show them. And you're expanding on them in 
sentences and paragraphs and alouds. So you've explained the world to your player, but they've asked a few questions, right? Yeah. That's great. You've noted down the questions. You'll address those. Now it's time to talk through your player's character concept and add world context to their character. You may need to talk to them uh, if you're playing a world that they're not familiar with, if they have playable races that you're not familiar with. You may need to talk to them a little bit about those playable races. Hopefully that's information that is in your primer. And you can talk about where they fit in the world. The next step is to add world context to that character. So I'm going to take D&D 5e as an example. Your character, your player has selected a character background. Bam, they're a noble but that doesn't mean anything by itself. Noble means a thousand different things in every culture. So what you can do is you don't just give them noble, you give them a family name, you give them a crest, you give them a famous ancestor, you give them uh, a small story behind their family, you give them a motto. This is the stuff that adds character to your world and also adds context. But also knowledge, and knowledge is like knowledge is power, and we have discussed this a lot. The fact that when there is nothing more awkward than a storyteller coming to you and say, "You know this," and then you turning and saying to the players, "Now nah, you know this," you know, don't have to tell you again. Yeah. But think about this. Think if, for example, you say to that noble, five years ago you graduated from university on that city. Yeah. In that city, whatever the city's name is, you know, first, first of all, the three people that you were really hang, hang, hanging out with, you had a very good relationship with the guy who was doing, for example, the flailing in the university, if that's a course you took. And there's also an inn called that in that city that you used to go there during your university years and effectively uh, like hang out. That means that the next time that the players visit the city, you automatically have connections that nobody else will have in that party. Yeah. You will know about the inn, you will know about the people, you will have connections and friends that you might be able to approach to help you out or to get information from or anything that might be. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's all about giving them context. As I said, if they're a noble, make sure you give them a family home somewhere and make sure they know the name of that location because whenever they hear the name of that location, now in character, they're gonna say, oh, that's where my family home is. And they feel a relationship to that place, even though A, it's a made up place, B, it's a made up character, and C, it's a place that their character hasn't even been in game, already they've generated an attachment to it. That is so valuable. So a lot of players, and this is important, a lot of players get, oh, sorry, I missed a bit. These, these little details um, that only they know make the world feel like it's theirs. They give them that real bond, you know, like you Absolutely, were saying. Yeah. Um, now, some players get very excited about co-creation and um, they might start generating their own ideas. That's not necessarily a bad thing. That could be an amazing thing because again, they're getting emotionally invested and creatively invested with the world, right? That's awesome. But if they start to stray outside your genre, if they start to stray outside your tone, like I'm in a D&D 5e world, but actually I've decided my character is an alien, but it's medieval fantasy world. It's genre breaking. So what you can use is the yes and, or the no but, but tool. Now this is something that Guy talks about. This is something that we've talked about before. Essentially, you can say, no, you're not an alien, but you are from the other continent. So you are other, you are different, but you're not from outer space, right? You're from another part of the world. So you give, them, you give them what they wanted, which is to be other, but they're not an alien. You can also use yes and to bring things back to earth. So my father gave me the most powerful magic sword in the world. Yes, and it's out of charges. So you can't use, you can't have an OP item at level one. So now I've given you a personal quest. Nice, what you got ask, what about the no? Smack! <laughs> <laughs> well, we do not condone violence, but yes, sometimes it might be necessary to be fair. So this is a this is a process that you can go through with your players. The ones that get very excited about co-creation, you can use this yes and no but tool to keep them in your um in your meta essentially. And the ones that need prompting, we have three questions for you, which are very very useful because we all have those players at the, at the table who just need a little bit of a little bit of prompting. exactly yeah. just a little bit of encouragement 
So asking them, where was your character born? Was it a rural or urban environment? Um, that is something that is really helpful because then you can place them on the map, right? Um, and that's a very easy distinction. Were you born in a city? Were you born in the countryside? Yeah. It changes a little bit the worldview. And once you've placed them on the map, you can give them information about their culture, traditions, languages, the worldviews from where they come from, this kind of information. And depending on the location they are playing, for example, if they are playing in a fantasy world, and I'm sure I'm taking this example because we're talking about rural, rural and non-rural environment, that will also possibly limit the amount of information they have. Absolutely. Because even in Star Wars, for example, Luke wouldn't have so much information about the world unless if there was for his uncle that talked to him about it or for people who talked to them about it in the Star Wars cantina kind of thing. Like, consider that people who live in rural areas do not have the same level of access to information that people who live in a city. And that is completely the, the, the balance of the campaign or the, you know, the world you're creating from their eyes. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really helpful thing. And actually, that brings me beautifully onto question two. Once you've figured out where they're born and you've placed them on the on the map, even if the map is just a sketch, that's fine. How did you come by the skills, training and equipment that you have now? A level one character already has class. Oh yeah, they got class. <laughs> She's they a bard too, they do. <laughs> they have background, they have equipment at level one. They don't run naked and screaming into the world with no training. Unless it's that kind of game, right? Um, or your character. So figuring out where they got the training. If they're a ranger, how did they learn those skills? If they're a mage, did they go to a, a university? If they're a scholar, where did those skills come from? Um, that's... And even for somebody like Sorcerer, for example, that would be completely not self-taught, but necessarily comes from somewhere, yeah. they still have skills. They still have things like tools and things like that. that I mean, I'm talking about specifically D&D now, but it's true for most games. These come from somewhere. They don't. You don't just wake up one day and say, "Oh yes, and I know how to play the fiddle." So really, yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So all of those backgrounds, they have story attached to them. All of those classes or um, or abilities and skills, because again, in most systems there are skills, right? How did they learn those skills? That is um, that is absolutely a way into world building that will link them to your world. You can, um, you can create organizations, you can create brotherhoods, guilds, colleges, holy orders. This is a beautiful place to start filling out in sentences and paragraphs, instances in your world that will link players to, uh, through character through to character. world. Yeah, for example, for the example we used before for the noble, automatically you have a city name, you have an inn, you have three characters and a university. All of those does not have to be more than a sentence or a paragraph long, and you automatically have information that A, nobody else has, and B, that added to your world and made it feel that they have agency in your world. And the other thing is you've just given them experience. If they spent three years at university, you've just given your, that character three years of their life and a whole set of experiences. And of course, educational institutions, all of those organization types that I just uh, rattled off, they don't work in vacuums. They have alumni, they have colleagues, professors, lots of NPCs in them. They have sister institutions. They have relationships with other institutions. So to take a British example, um, if you created Oxford and Cambridge University, you can then create a rivalry between the two. So all of a sudden when your character meets somebody from the other university, you ha automatically have a rival NPC Indeed. immediately. That's beautiful. So that's just two questions. The first is, where were you born, urban or rural? The second is, how do you come by the stuff you have at level one? And the third, you invite them to create three NPCs from their background. If they're really enjoying it, they can create more, but three is a good number to start with. And you ask them to give one sentence about each. These NPCs might be mentors, relatives, rivals, lovers, friends, uh, people who took them in when they were orphans, people who taught them things. There's, there's people who bullied them. There's absolutely a thousand kinds of NPCs in the world. So you want a name and you want one sentence about what each person means to you. So easy. That's three sentences your players have to come up with. And they don't even have to write down the sentences. They can just generate the ideas and you write down the sentences. This gives you some powerful blackmail material for later. Ooh, as, a, yeah. as a GM, we want to create emotionally charged 
stories. When someone from our past walks into the room in the real world, we go, oh my God, what are you doing here? Hi, it's been so long. Even if that person is a rival, or actually if that person is a rival, you get a different posture. If that person is a mentor, you give them a big hug, right? So you're, you're opening up emotion, you're opening up um, all of this stuff that you can use later to tell these amazing stories. So just to recap that, where were you born, urban or rural? How did you come by the stuff you have right now? And name three NPCs from your life so far, and one sentence about what they mean to you. With that information, you have already created a lot of context for your character. True. That is awesome. Because what you can do now is go back to your cycle. You've played your session zero. Although no dice have been rolled necessarily, you've got a lot of information, you've done something creative, session zero has been played. What that means is that it's time for the learn phase. You take away what your character has created, what your PC has created, and you, uh, you build that into your primer. So for example, you might want to add a sentence uh, or even half a sentence when you talk about a major city, by the way, Oxford University is here. What that means is that when your players now read the primer, they're gonna go, oh, that's where my university is. Your players are saying, my university, look at that. You've just built a link between a player and an imaginary place through a character experience. Very true. That's what we're trying to do here. That's the beauty of session zero. So you go back in the learn, sorry, you go back to learning, you consider what your players have asked you, you consider what your players have told you and what your players have got excited about. You go to your design phase and you consider how you can add that into the world. And how it is linked to the rest of the world. Absolutely, and how that fits in with your meta information. Because of course, at all times, we don't want to build stuff that breaks the world. We don't want mosaic world building. We want world building that is contiguous, that makes sense, that feels authentic, even when rule of cool is at play. Then we build out in sentences. Sometimes a few words is enough. Just add in those little details <laughs> to your primer. And the beautiful thing about this is that you can add things as rumor. So rumor has it, there's something shady about this important family, but nobody knows what it is, except the player who's from that family, who knows what the shady thing is, they're smugglers or they're whatever. And that makes the players feel smart, which is the other thing you want to do. Indeed. Um, so this is all about getting your players so excited about your world that they cannot wait to come to the table. And that is, that is a beautiful way to start your campaign. So now you share your primer with your players. Make sure they read it. Players are notoriously bad at reading loud swathes of information. That's why we keep the primer nice and short. That's why we keep it in sentences and paragraphs. Um, but uh, this is what's really going to reinforce those stories that you told them. It's what's going to make sure that that stuff that you've created is the same as what they were imagining because that's another important thing. Absolutely. As you talk in session zero, they can have one idea. You can misinterpret that. So this is a lovely space to just sort of just sort of check that everything is aligned. Absolutely. And I think it is very important to say that one of the things that you haven't considered probably so far is that if you have created your session zeros with your players and now you're writing your primer, you can go to your player and say, oh, by the way, the things we talked about during session zero are now on the primer please go check it out and let me know if you're happy with them. And this is a very good incentive for a player who wouldn't have read to read because the moment you made it about them, they They're would engaged. read it. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's psychology 101. We're interested in ourselves and we're inter interested in stuff that pertains to ourselves. So yeah, absolutely. You just, you're going to like lure them in and then they'll be so happy that you did that. That's, that's what this is all about. So we've played our session zero. We've learned what the players want. We've learned how to get them into the world. We've learned the things that put context in the world for them. We've designed those into the world and we've built them into the primer. What what's comes next? Session one. So we've done it. We've done the setup. We've built the world. We are ready to play. Let the dice roll. It's time to talk about how the cycle looks. So you play your session. We are not the experts. Guy is the expert on the actual GMing stuff. 
that is where he shines. So we do the world building, we have, we, we have the method, we have everything else, but go talk to Guy if you want to know all the details of how to make amazing voices and how to screw with your players, right? That's his job. That's his job. Um, what we can tell you as you play, keep notes. These might be notes in World Anvil. You can write them in an article. You can write them in the notebook. That's what I tend to do. Or you can use the digital Game Masters screen, which we have. So I also tend to write them there. Um, in the stream. In the stream, yeah. yeah. So actually, as a player, I use the, uh, the notebook. And as a GM, I use the stream mm -hmm. because it's quicker. Interesting. That's what I need. Yeah. Um, so, uh, or, I mean, frankly, you can keep them on a coaster if you want to. Um, but just just don't lose them. That's the, the point thing. is that you have to keep notes and you have to make careful, be careful of how you keep your notes because there is nothing wrong. I'm trying to put this room through, you'll elaborate on that, but there is nothing worse than finishing a session and being like, what the crap did I see it now? Yeah, wait, I know I made something about a banana and then they laughed and then someone got a beer, it's gone. And uh, you don't want that because you want to maintain the continuity, right? That's that's what we're about with world building. It's keeping up the veil that this thing we made is real, okay? It's that suspension of disbelief. And when you have irregularities in your world, things that are different session to session, that's when you use the, the, um, the uh, suspension of disbelief. So, few hints on keeping notes. As you play, Put a star or some other signifier, could be a banana, could be a little dinosaur, next to items which will need to be expanded. So we've talked about writing in sentences and paragraphs, but if the players are going to the place that is a sentence big right now, if something has been mentioned twice and the players are now starting to really show interest in it, like, oh, that's really interesting, the cult of the secret rose wonder how we could learn more about that. It's time to build the cult of the secret rose, which frankly only has a name right now, but now they want to know more. So now you write a sentence in a paragraph. True. I actually use a, a system with severance. Okay. So I use one severance up, which something is uh, kind of discussed, but never done anything. I bought yeah. the two severance, one after the other, if the thing is actually r like gaining up speed and I see them actually being more interesting. And a star, if it actually means that, oh shit, I have, sorry, excuse my language, I have to do it for the next session. Yeah. Also, some cases you see that you drop a hint and they're completely ignoring it. At this point, yeah. they actually put a, a server looking down, which means everything will be, eh, not really. Like, they, they do not go for that because so do, do, not, do not bother, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And again, uh, my third instance was if they're straight up asking questions. So if they turn to the GM and they say, what do I know about this? You know you need to build an extra paragraph for it. You can, you can fumble for a bit, but you know that if they straight up want to know more, you're going to have to build it for next session. And that's where your, your, <laughs> your extra marks come in. So these are signifiers that your players want to know more about something. And that's great. That's really good. That means they're curious. And that means you have one more paragraph to write. That's, that's not too daunting, is it? You're going to be fine. I believe in you. Uh, make a note when you sow a seed. So this is Guy's terminology, which we've adopted because it's so beautiful. Sowing seeds is when you drop like a little tidbit of information. Sometimes it's a name or a detail or a rumor. Somebody asks about something and you're like, oh yeah, they, well, they better be talking about something. Yeah, they're talking about this guy that's just been arrested. You, you have no idea how it's going to fit into your world yet. You just, it's a seed. So you just do a little thing, guy arrested in jail. That's it. Sorry. No, no, I was about to say exactly that, that. Sometimes you don't even need to know what it is about. You just have to write it down because you need to expand it possibly. Exactly, exactly. And again, when they show interest, you can improvise through the session and then you can um, you can go from there and, uh, and expand it if it needs expanding. And finally, make a note when you drop a seed. Um... Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. Make a... I, I timed out. <laughs> My brain climbed out. It just, I went blue screen. That was it. That, that ended. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, if your players don't uh, notice the foreshadowing for something, you can make a note next to a seed that you need to drop again. Very true. And again, you can drop it in a different way. If you dropped it once in a conversation, the second time you can drop it in, uh, in a billet or in a, in a secret note 
or um, it's in a tapestry or a song or a you know overheard conversation. There's a hundred ways to drop these seeds, right? Again, that is Guy's business. That's where Guy thrives. If you need to drop another seed in, in the next session, write a little note so you know. And uh, pay attention to what your players focus on. We keep saying it. We keep saying it. Very true. When your players are asking questions about something, they're curious. Even if they're asking questions in character, they're still curious as people. So uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's that's the play section. It's really just about documenting what's happened. Then we go around the cycle to learn. In the learn phase, there's a couple of different things you can do. I think it's really important to ask your players for feedback. Lots of people have different ways to do this at the end of the session. Um, I think it's a great thing to ask what's going through your character's heads right now, because that puts it in role play, right? That's why we're all here. We're all at the table because we're role playing. So figuring out what's going through the character's heads is figuring out where they want to go next. And that's really useful when it's, it's time to figure out what you're building next. What did you um, enjoy? always a good question you can garner so much from spit takes and laughter and shocked faces and people dropping things but just straight up asking them what they enjoyed is a really helpful question because you know what kind of what kind of direction you want to go in and anything you want me to change this is very useful because it's not what did i do wrong which can be a bit offensive as a gm if you're like oh what did i do wrong what can I do better? And then they give you this big list and you're like, I don't want to play anymore. But what can I change is really, really useful because it helps you um, It helps you know, again, if there's things they didn't like, if there's things they did like, you know, you know how to refine what you're doing. Think about how your players reacted. Think about what you learned about your PCs because they won't have told you everything and they will start to reveal stuff about their characters as the characters develop. So as you learn that stuff, you know where to take the world building. What seeds you dropped, how your players reacted, do you need to drop them again? That's also part of the learn phase. If you notice that they're really not picking up on stuff, you drop something very significant, but they, they really didn't comment on it, it never came into the feedback, that's something that needs to go down again if it's important for the adventure. And that's it, that's the learn phase. Dream and design. This is the space where you filter all that information. You've got the information in, you've thought about this, uh, and now you're thinking about it, essentially. Mm -hmm. So you'll start to think about which seeds you should develop. If you take my notes away, I can't talk. I'm sorry. Um, and you can start to think about where the action goes next. Again, that player feedback is so useful. If they tell you, oh, my player just, just really needs to go to the city and buy some pants because I've been running around without pants for three sessions and I can't do it anymore, then you're building the city. That's, that's what you're building next. So you know in that design phase what's coming next. And uh, yeah, again, like looking at those notes that you wrote, what needs further development in a sentence or a paragraph. We are not building more than that because we don't want to write the Silmarillion. We want to play a, an awesome game. And then you get to the build phase. You build things that you need. This is where you add your paragraphs. For example, if you've written a sentence or just a name for a lake and your players start heading that way, it's time to add a sentence or a paragraph. You might add, um, as we did yesterday, you might add a little bit of um, sort of in-session encounter, a sentence about a strange creature, um, an environmental effect, that's it, nothing more. Any information that you've established in a seed should be now added to an article that you've written. So if you had an article about a tavern and you've established that there's uh, the name of the NPC, write the name of the NPC in the article. Um, if the players go there and they read the menu, make sure that you write down the menu so that you can keep that continuity in the world. You keep building things out. And most importantly, you don't lose that world building so you can recreate it next time. You can recreate that space in the world. So you're not losing things. Um, yeah. And then you play session two. It's and three. And then session three. And then session four. And again, it's play and keep notes. Learn from what your players did and what you did. Design what comes next. 
in sentences and then build in sentences and paragraphs. And that is the trick. And then build up on, to on top of those paragraphs and sentences to grow more and more your articles exactly. as they become more required and more important. Exactly. As your players spend five sessions in the city because it's a habit they just can't quit, You add a paragraph each time for the new information they discover about the city. That is the, the trick. It's not writing a book about the city. It's expanding each session just a little bit to make it feel like the space is opening up to them. That, that is what you need as a game master. You don't need to write the whole setting book. You need to grow as the campaign grows. And uh, yeah, that's really it. So, a bunch of you folks were probably wondering at this point, well, that sounds nice, but what do I do when my characters give me no warning and suddenly head off that way? How do I deal with that? This is the big trick. So this, you folks will remember, we issued you preparation, NPC names, tavern names. Um, this, is, this is the space where you need to use those. Um, In most cases, if you improvise something off the cuff, it won't fit with your genre, it won't fit with your tone, it might be a little bit off. Our favorite uh, anecdote about this is uh, way back when, like years and years ago, maybe even a decade ago, Dimitri and I played a campaign. We were walking through an elven forest and three NPCs showed up and I said, what are their names? As all players say, what are their names? And Dimitri said, Boris. Scorus and Doris. So we have Boris, Scorus and Doris, the elves. Um, For quite some time. They were freaking hilarious. They did not die. Um, we kept expecting them to die, but they never did. Um, they were absolutely hilarious, but it was not supposed to be a funny moment. It was not supposed to be a funny campaign. It was actually supposed to be this tragic moment. And uh, it really broke the flow. Now, still enjoy the campaign, don't get me wrong, but that's a moment where having a list of 10 character names and then just writing a, writing three words next to the ones that you've used that session, that's where that comes in so useful because you don't have to break the flow to make something up. You don't have to break the flow and um, create something off the cuff that might be uh, not appropriate. You just have it there for you. It's all prepped. And there's tricks to do them more interesting as well. So. The important thing, as Janet said, is to make them appropriate to the location where the players currently are or with the location that we'll be exploring. And there are ways to make them more relevant and to make them even more big, for example, and feel actually much more, um, uh, let's say, varied. Yeah. So, for example, if you want to create 10 elven names because you are in elven land, yeah. you can use and say, you know what, all my mountains uh, end with lean. So, uh, my fen becomes muffinling them or something like sure. that by having this tool in your hand yes of course you can always use something like fantasy name generator or something like that but opening the, the browser going to fantasy name generator clicking the button finding the name choosing what you want being lost on the idea of clicking again to find another name because sometimes it happens you just completely broke the connection with your um players. with your players so Having those names written down beforehand, even if you do use fantasy name generator to do them, it is very important because then it's a matter of just turning your eyes to the left and then looking at your player and saying, Scott, file in. And it's done. Yeah. And then what you do, very important, you go back to your notes. However you use them, you say, file in the mountain that they saw up in the horizon. And that way, you know that you have to A, write a sentence for the mountain, and B, that the mountain is called file and you can put it in your map. Absolutely. So generating very quickly these kinds of conventions, naming conventions, both for characters and for, loca and for locations in a region, that's really useful, that's a very quick way to making world building that feels very contiguous and it feels like it, it, it all kind of matches together, right? Um, and again, for your local, like, location names, you can see we've got 10 location-specific character names, 10 locale-specific location names, You don't have to write the whole thing. So, for example, we went on a random generator and pulled up some Elfland names. Elfland. Uh, we have Yalantiel, Tholwil, Gorwin, Nim, Alassi, Muriel. That's, that's just some that we pulled from a random generator. But then you can add, um, you can add the town of, the mountain, Mont, Wood, 
ton, vil, right? You can add these suffixes, prefixes, these namespaces um, to make them appropriate and it only takes a second. Um, three ran fully fledged, not so random encounters. So these are things to have up your sleeve. They should include a stat block for your monster, at least one location attribute that makes the location interesting, at least one situational attribute, because the thing with a random encounter, right, is you want there to be a little bit of story there. And so something that tells the story. So you walk into a grove with three corrupted dryads, fine. You walk into a grove with three corrupted dryads and a goat chained in the middle, and you know exactly what is going on. There's a sacrifice about to happen. And if it's not a goat, but a child, all of a sudden your players have a reason to act, right? That's, that's that sort of situational attribute that gives your players the instinct and the story all in one. Give them a little hook. That is to say something that can lead to a side quest or an adventure if you want it to. Um, they don't have to follow it, but it makes it feel connected to the wider world. And remember, you have those five points of drama in your foundation. Any of those are hugely inspirational for this. Very true. All of that foundation, all of that setting the scene, that's all great fodder for pulling inspiration for these bits and bobs. It makes everything feel connected, makes you look like a genius GM. That's what we love. And uh, finally, give a reward and don't always make it money. So again, this is something that Guy talks about at length, how to motivate your players, um, but don't just make it XP, don't just make it a MacGuffin that they can sell. Think about interesting things that can be the reward. And again, that's, that's literally one sentence for each or just a stat block. And again, two little adventure hooks. Um, this can be, you find like someone hands you a wanted dead or alive poster over the bar, like in Skyrim. This can be a trader looking for help moving stock. These are tiny, tiny little things that you can just shove at your players when uh, when they do something you don't expect and you just you just need them to just not quite get to the lake yet. Which leads me to slicing time. It's very easy to forget that we make up time at the table. Um, as an example, The Lord of the Rings is three amazing books long, but I can summarize it by saying Frodo takes the ring to Mordor. It doesn't do it justice, but it's, it's a very quick way to deliver that story. Sometimes you want the quick way. <laughs> Sometimes you just want to say, okay, so you shop for two hours and you get what? That's fine. But sometimes you need to also slow your players down. So when you're speeding things up, you can ask for compound checks. You can summarize. You can say, if nobody wants to do anything else, this. And when you want to slow things down, you can introduce more story and more complexity. You can pull in those encounters, those uh, small fry hooks. Um, you can create social encounters with NPCs. There's so much you can do to stop your players getting to the lake that you haven't built yet. Yeah, and because the session more or less, it is going to be an X amount of hours, unless you're playing in university and you play for eight hours straight, which I hate you for right now because I don't cannot do you that anymore. That so much, don't you? So much. But regardless, a session will last in a, in a go for two, three, maybe four hours. You can fill this time and you can fill this time with something that will actually be interested, yeah. interesting, sorry. Something will be on point in the drama and will follow the theme of the world. And that is where it comes. And that's what we're all about here. We're making sure that your world feels like one place. So you're not getting genre whiplash when the aliens come out the elven wood. We want to make sure that it's maintaining the tone even if there's funny bits and dramatic bits and light bits and dark bits, we're not talking about making it monotone. We are talking about making sure that the Witcher doesn't feel like fantasy rainbow land. That's weird. It doesn't make sense. It, it, it unnerves your players and they don't know what to expect. So just pulling in from all the meta that we've made, create those quick things and then Dr. Stranger players. You, you can do it. You, and, and that is how agile world building works. Create your foundation, trust the cycle and remember that if everything goes to crap you have an ace up your sleeve because you are the game master thank you so much for listening and i think that we should go to questions now there for are this. a lot aren't there there are some extremely good questions Ooh, love that um i had quite some hard time tracking them sorry that's why i wasn't talking no, so no, much because okay. i wanted to make sure i kept a cup i 
it's oh, it so good. all of them. Yeah. But they were really good questions. People were amazing. So, um, guys, if you still have questions, please let us know. We will not be able to answer all of them ad infinitum because we have to go to the next stage, which is very important as well. Yes. But let's answer some of them which are related to the talk. Yeah, I would some... like to mention as well that we go live five times a week and we have a special webinar talk always on a Tuesday. So if you have more questions, drop in on a Tuesday at 7 o'clock BST. This, this is this time, Literally exactly. This, this time, time, but every Tuesday. Every Tuesday, we go live with a webinar. So if you have world building questions, questions about agile world building, game mastering questions, drop in and we will answer them. What we there do. is much more to the talk, by the way. Don't go away. The thank you is because we are finishing the first part, not the. Maybe you part. should move it to a different slide. Just yeah. so people let's go to going. another slide. Put, put the deer. We like the deer. Okay, let's. That's session zero. Session zero, deer. That's session zero, number seventeen. Yeah, yeah that one. Deer. Yeah. Oh Excellent. dear. Oh dear. So, is there a template for the primer? No. There's not a template for the primer, and I don't think there will be a template for the primer because the primer should be very personal to your world and to your campaign and to your players. Yeah. What I would say is that yesterday we were called to create a book, and I think that if we create a book, uh, that will definitely be there and structuring and things like from a psychology perspective and from an information architecture perspective will definitely be there to help yeah, you out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for now, if you're building one on World Anvil, use a generic article template. And uh, you can see that they made great use in the ones that we showed of things like the sidebar of sectioning. So that's a great way to sort of divide the information so it all looks absorbable for your players. Yes. The next question is, if we still want to participate in the World Anvil Buds, do we need to submit the home uh, the homework even if it's late through the same link? Is there a deadline for why participation badge? I would say that the deadline is probably now-ish. End we, of today. End of today, we'll say yes. But please do not think, send tomorrow and ask us to do that because at some point we have to stop. We have to it. have a cutoff because otherwise we will go crazy. Yes, and we will have the time and we will arrange some time to have another talk like this one that will be going through specifically the homework yeah. to give you some more information. Absolutely. Today we'll go through, I think, eight or nine, which which was very hard to choose because there are hundreds that were submitted. Yeah. But uh, we will give you, we try to find some of the things that will help you become better in writing those. Yeah, we try to pick some good teaching examples, essentially. Yes. How do you handle adding details on the spot you end up not liking later? Oh, that is a very good question, in fact. So the thing is, it will happen sometimes. And storytellers have an extremely good ability, which is to shape the world around them and to be unreliable narrators. Exactly what I was going to say. Not everything that you say to your players is true or should be true. And if you do not like it, make it a lie. That is the or a rumor or a miscommunication or a crazy person. There's so much that you can do with this. And uh, yeah, even it adds sort of complexity and mystery to your world as well. So yeah, the trick of the unreliable narrator is a beautiful way to wreck on stuff. Would you recommend not sharing the world map to the, with the players if you have one? So first of all, I would say definitely not share all your worlds. I, I will let you know, say what you want to say about Devon's advice, because I'm pretty sure that you're going to say that. But what I will say is this. In fantasy medieval England or medieval England, pretty much nobody knew how the world looked like. It's a very small amount of people that really knew understood how the world looked like. And the chances are that for people from rural areas will be the same. Now, if you are a merchant or if you're a king or a general or somebody who's plotting a, 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 like a, a journey through the world, you might have this information. In general, you won't. Also, maps used to be extremely rare and expensive. If you do not make them rare, make them something that they will have to fight for even with money or with essentially finding another way to do it. In a science fiction world or in a modern world, oh, wow, we became big. In a science fiction world or um, a world like modern times, accessing maps will be much easier, but also maps are just representations of reality. They don't have to be 100% accurate. accurate and definitely they don't have to be 100% uh, uh, clear on what they're showing. So use it as you want and make sure that you just create something that the players will enjoy discovering again and again and going back to. Players are like magpies. If, they show, if you show them shiny things, they will want them. That is completely normal. So my advice, show them a sketch of the world if you're going to make a pretty map, show them a pretty map of the region you want them to be in. Because if you show them something beautiful over there, 
A, they will want to go there because it's beautiful, and B, they might interpret that as a story hook for, oh, they want me to go there, right? So give your magpies the shinies as incentive. Show them where you want them to be by showing them the shiny things where you want them to be, right? That's that's what I would say. So um, yeah, that's a Devon Roo advice as well. Yes, so I personally have a problem in role-playing NPCs and remembering each one, uh, each one. Any tips? Yes, keep. I mean, I would say use the DSTS because the DSTS and well done will give you the list of your NPCs. And you can pull them up in a second. But also in preparation for your session, even if you are using an, a, a, a normal, uh, um, how do you call that? A normal um, storyteller screen. Yeah. Make sure you have post-it notes with the most important NPCs and a secondary uh, list of the NPC and where did you find them because NPCs most of the time are referred to the location they're at than anything else. Yeah. If you do voices for your NPCs, write down the voice. So if it's a high-pitched voice or low, so you can just write high Scottish if you do accents. I don't do accents. I do funny voices. So I write down just like the three characteristics of the voice and two characteristics of the way they look. And that is plenty. I have signed up for World Downville. It seems amazing, but I don't know how anything works. And it's been a bit of intimidating. Is there a guide and any recommends on um, just leave it as I go? Uh, well, you will definitely learn things as you go. It's not even a question, but there's a big button on the very top of World Downville, which is the documentation button. And my beloved wife has spent about three months just creating videos youtube.com slash World Downville. And there are massive amounts of lists with helps about every single location in World Downville. And of course, as you go through Well Danville, you will see the videos there as well on the help sections. Yeah. Um, once you get started, you will discover that all the logic is the same. It's just like any program. Once you start using it, the, you'll, you'll just figure out the logic and it'll all be fine. Until you get there, every interface has a video with my stupid face. <laughs> the videos are between five and 10 minutes long and they walk you through what you're looking at. So watch the videos, give, give them time and you will get there. It's really not that complicated, I promise. Um, next. Next question, I don't want to miss this no, one. No, that's okay. uh, the question is, um, should you customize your primer to its PC? That's a very good question. So the answer is, there will definitely be some things that everybody will know. And then you can use subscriber groups and give them to your players and then create in those information that will be only for them. I used to do for different races, different like species essentially, different um, uh, organizations that the players belong to because they will give different information to that and definitely location of uh, uh, birth essentially, birth location. Because by putting those down and giving subscriber groups to each of them, I can give to each of my players a completely different experience from the same article. Yeah, so you don't have to but it adds a lot of richness to your campaign and it's very easy to do in World Anvil. If you're curious, go to the access management section, the access rights on the left-hand side, and that there's a video that shows you how to do that. It's very easy. And uh, how do you make, um, how do NPCs affect world building? I will not go into this question because it's a massive one. The answer is your NPCs is everyone who your players will ever know or not know. It's essentially everybody else living. So. Of course, they have an impact to the world. They are the world in many so ways. So I would say that they are they are products of the world. That's how they affect the world building, is that they are affected by the world building, essentially. Um, so the NPCs that people are dealing with are products of the world. They are products of the uh, foundation and scene setting stuff that you've created. Um, and uh, they're a great vehicle to deliver world building, essentially. Um, this uh, question was about uh, the if what if they are from different cultural classes. I think we've already answered that. Yeah. Uh, create your primer with subscriber groups that will allow you to, in fact, show a different complete experience to each other uh, yeah, yeah. than normal. And then embed things as secrets. Exactly. Or just use a subscriber container as yeah. well. That's also very easy. Uh, what is uh, what are good incentive techniques to use to encourage organic? Uh, Forming background forming links. Backgrounds links between player characters. That's a very Great good question. question. Here we talked about the session zero, not per player, but in the whole party. Today. No, we haven't. We haven't. We had to cut this down. But in fact, uh, something we forgot to say today is that apart from session zero with each of your players, 
you should have after this a session zero with all your characters together. If you can. If you can, which will allow you to get them to talk about their players, introduce each other to them, to them if they know each other, and then create those connections. Absolutely. So um, this is an optional stage, but it's a really lovely one. If you have players who are just desperate to get started, you can start with um, level uh, with uh, session one. If you can do a group session zero, that's a beautiful place to build these bonds. There are a lot of different exercises for this. So you can go around and say how you met each other, if you want them to know each other already. You can say how I am related to you, how I am related to you, how I am related to you, and go around the circle, if you see what I mean. So you build sort of single bonds going around so everybody is connected but not everybody's connected to each other. Very true. And there are some actually very good things you can do about that as well, that you uh, invite your players in a chain to say, how do you know the person before you and what connects you to the person after you? But that way, essentially, you rebuild and you allow your players to recreate what the other said to create a much more interesting and convoluted network of connections between them. Totally. And uh, remember how powerful organizations are. It's just what I would say. Organizations hire people, they educate people, all of that space. So organizations, if you're if you want a specific way to connect people, organizations can be very like that's my go to essentially. So I skipped a lot of session zero and I have had several sessions. Can I go back to the players and um, go back and ask the player stuff? Well, the answer to that is what you do after the session. After each session, you should keep uh, the opportunity, as Janet said before, to talk to your players and ask them how they're doing. You can use these sessions alternatively as a personal interview for character growth. This is a very good opportunity, especially when you have big uh, uh, times between uh, s uh, sessions, effectively if they, they have extended downtime, for example, to sit down to him, okay, let, let's see, what happened to you the last three months, for example, that you were out in the road? How does this affect you? How does it change your character? And in a way, you kind of do a session zero, but you do it essentially midway. I would also say that um, as you grow, as players grow into their characters, because most people come to session one with a concept and a character sheet, but not a fully fleshed out character. So around session four, it's not bad to have a second session zero, like session zero A. Um, <laughs> And literally sit down and say, so tell me a little bit more about your character. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. Have you had any thoughts on this? Um, and, and sort of go through this process again, if you want to, if your players are game for it. Again, it depends on the kind of group. Some groups just want to roll dice and kill stuff and to engage with the plot. And if you have players like that, you might not want to do this. Some players love character play, role play, character interactions. And those are the ones where you might want to go back and have a second session zero or a third session zero and really continue to build, continue to develop if they're up for it. And you know your players best. But also be careful because that can make some players feel they have a much more uh, important role to your player to your story than other players and that mm -hmm. can create an imbalance in your party so handle it carefully and give everyone the opportunity if they wish to have time with you or you get the danger of creating essentially a diva in your party and then can cause a lot of problems anyway yeah guy make has sure some you really share good, the spotlight yeah guy has some really good videos about that as well yeah uh, when an article has a seed does that mean seed that refer to this article or seed that might be sown when players are dealing with the subject of this article? Well, both is the answer to that. It depends on how you handle them and depends on why you put them there. In most cases, seeds are created while you're on session and you want to keep a note for something that just happened or for something that you do not want to write in the article just yet, but you want it to be there to know that it's there. So for example, if uh, somebody said something about a valley, for example, or a battlefield, you just can leave it there as a seed saying, the players know that something happened in that battlefield and that is what they know but you haven't in the article because there is no way for them to go or there is no there is no way that they will be going there anytime soon exactly it's also down to personal preference but i like to put um gm hooks and seeds that i might grow in a secret section at the bottom of the article and seeds that i have sown at the top in that secret gm's bit that's how i handle it because i find i just find that the most useful so next question, my players are much less experienced than me and tend to be nervous about offering concerns or criticism. Any suggestions? Honesty box. Well, I, would, I was about to say, talk to them privately. And that's what you do. In fact, if you're talking about agile goal building as part of agile methodology in development as well, talk to your players in private. If they do not feel comfortable, don't put them on the spot. They yeah. will be comfortable later on as they gain more confidence for the time being. Just say, you know what? Can I go out for a coffee and chat about it a little bit? 
There's no yeah. problem about that. And they will feel actually a bit more special as well. And that makes them more uh, engaged. Yeah, the other, as I say, other ways, um, encourage them to leave notes that are anonymous and then you can see them. That's another way of doing it. Next question. So if the idea is to have World Dummy open as a DM um, at the table, do you suggest having a draft article that you can tap into, tidy up later and set your notes? So there are many ways of doing that. I actually do something that you have, what you define here as well. In many cases, I will create a folder into my world and that folder I call session notes. And I literally have articles that are called session zero notes or session one notes. So there's a generic article template. Exactly, generic article. Or I use it a report article as well sometimes. And this is only for me. And this is just for me to keep notes during the session. Uh, I have also done, of course, the idea of opening the digital storyteller screen in World Danville that allows me to have a stream. I found that the stream is good for some things while it's not good for others. So for example, for me to handle um, treasure that the players got or items they have found or people they have talked to, the stream is really good. When it comes to fleshing out information about locations I should build or notes I should not forget or an, or an NPC that I have just created, Sometimes I use the DSTS to automatically create the story, the uh, NPC, or depending on the po on the point of the session I am, I might put them in an article. So it is really up to you and whatever makes you feel more comfortable. I would suggest that you try both and you see what fits best for you. Absolutely. I use the DSTS as a storyteller. As a player, I like to use the World Anvil notebook. This is a notebook set up a little bit like OneNote, essentially. So I have a, um, a book called... Uh, RPG session notes. I have uh, sections within that with each campaign that I'm playing. And then I create pages for each session. So I have session zero, session one, session two, that just has random notes. DSTS is digital storytellers screen. Is what you find once you create a campaign in World Anvil and create a session and you hit the play button. Yeah, it's it's like the biggest secret of World Anvil. And we, <laughs> we don't know how to show it better. So if you if you are curious, let me know. It's, um yeah, if you want to know more about it, you can also see the, the little video about it that I have created that sort of walks you through what it does. You can keep your session notes, you can see all your player characters, you can create NPCs, you can roll dice, you can roll modified dice, you can roll exploding dice, uh, you can have- <laughs> Michael Bay dice. You can have all your music there, you can give uh, images and articles to your characters, you can do a whole bunch of stuff that we think is useful for game masters. And as I say, I use it a lot. I find it very, very useful. So um, yeah, if that sounds good, you can check that out. It's one of the free features of World Anvil. So yeah, if you want to use it, you can use it. Next question, what is the real distinction between the design and build phases? And I will answer it very quickly. The difference is that on design phase, you sit down with your beer, coffee, tea, whatever you want, somewhere you chill and you just think about things without having to write anything. It's a very important... Um, Go on, keep We're going places apparently. Go places. It's a very important part to remember because uh, you should not be writing the same time you're thinking about things because what it will lead you to is write way more than you need and also go into rabbit hole. Sit down, even if that's 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and simply think about what would you like to write and why would you like to write it. Um, in the person template, is this is what referring to in the race? Yes, that's the answer. Yes. That's a very simple so answer. So there's a little terminology problem that I don't want to dig into, but essentially what they call in D&D races, we call species because it's a it's a much bigger category than what race means essentially technically from a scientific point of view. So that's why we that's why we do it that way. And the final question is the meta examples you used in the slides yesterday from what book came from? If you're talking about our book Oh, no, sorry, the meta, sorry. Unless they're talking about, I was about to say, it's our book, which is not done yet, unless they're talking about Trent Hergen Raiders collaborative world building, which is a beautiful, is. it's not there. It's not here. Uh, it's a beautiful book, and you should check it out for sure. So I'm question about that. Absolutely. Um, so that's Trent Hergen Raiders collaborative world building. If you go to collaborativeworldbuilding.com, you can uh, you can find more about it. It's a fantastic book. He's not paying us to say this. He's just a wonderful person. He also uses World Anvil. And we like him. And I think it's now, Janet, team. we'll go to the next section of our uh, talk. Yeah. Which is going through the workshop materials we have gathered yeah. from yesterday. It's time to see what you folks did. Exactly. We had so many incredible submissions, guys. It was truly amazing. So thank you, everybody who wrote something. Thank you, everybody who submitted something. I hope that it was a useful exercise for you guys. I know some people... 
um, sort of extrapolated from worlds they already created, and some people created new worlds. Both are absolutely fine. And uh, we picked out a couple of examples that we thought would be useful to sort of unpack a little bit more the foundation and setup phase of, of this agile world building technique, and it, which is, of course, again, all about only writing what you need when you need it. So the first example I'm going to talk about here is from AK Writer, if I remember correctly. Nice. And we want to talk a bit about motivation. So just to be clear, by the way, guys, we're not trying to, uh, in, at any point, throw shade at anybody. We're trying to teach you how to do what you're doing better and how you should be actually working on things to make them easier for you to work with. Totally. We're just, we're just trying to support you. And again, all of these examples have excellent things in them. What we're focusing on is the areas that we think are teachable moments. Essentially. Exactly. So the first uh, thing that we have to share about this actually is about the motivation. And it says, I wanted to create a world which would suit my needs for d and and earlier Pathfinder adventures, which would give me enough. Uh, enough space to fill it with my new ideas. Creating is caring. Creating is caring. That's Great. very true. Love that. Yes. But... What you should do when you're creating the motivation for your world is something that will be effectively a reason for you to continue doing it. Although what you have posted here is a good reason to start, it's a motivation for you. On the hard day that you do not want anymore to continue working because your players pissed you off or because you are tired, that won't get you going. You need to write something down there which will be in fact that. Like, what is something that really I hold dear to my heart about this world that will make me uh, like it? It can be even a cool thing that you've made about it. Like, for example, I love how I made this location. I would like more of this. Sure. So essentially really digging into why this world? You know, not just not just why a world, but why this world? That's That's what the motivation needs to be because that's what's going to keep you coming back to this project, right? And I've had that with my own... Uh, campaigns. I've had that with my own novels. I need to have something that keeps me coming back and stops me going off and creating shiny new worlds, because that's how you end up with 15 campaign settings that are all this deep. Yes. We're going to zoom in on the article now so that you can see it a little <laughs> bit better. Zoom, zoom. I was afraid how the clicks in the bottom. I zoom, side zoom. Yeah, yeah. I zoom, zoom. I, do you want to go through the rest of the thing from my key writer or should we continue with Kelly? Um, yeah, let's talk about the themes here as well. The themes. Okay, here we are. So uh, what we have here is super awesome. The world is really, really cool. Fantasy, horror, lots of... So what they've captured in the player experience is that um, although it's a sort of very exciting, dangerous world, there's a, there's a sort of swap between it's a dark tone, but actually the tone of the storytelling is not serious. So although it's a crappy world, the storytelling stone is quite light and that's awesome. What we wanted to visit here were the recurring themes because the point of themes, these are almost like snapshots, repeated actions essentially, which help you reinforce the tone. So we wanted to unpack a little bit the second one. The first one is great. Magically powered machinery is an awesome theme to keep having recurring. Yes, because you can find them essentially locations around your world and you can uh, expand to them and you can show them again and again without any problem. Absolutely. The second one is a hard, is not technically a storytelling theme or motif. So what you have is slowly revealing connection between all the little strings and characters' backgrounds and an ever-growing conspiracy of the evil forces. That is not a motif that I can repeat. That is an overarching thread. And that's, it's a subtle distinction, but that's what we wanted to bring up with this section. It's such a cool idea, but it's not technically a theme and motif that you can repeat. So when talking motifs, we think, think of more simple things, like the first one, for example, machinery uh, and wonders and, and dangers, or for example, the sound of leaves in autumn or the howling of the wolf at the hillside, exactly. the crashing of waves against the shore kind of thing, or uh, beautiful women that are deadly and they want to kill you. I mean, this is kind of like the Bond thing, you know I mean? That, yeah. the, 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 the idea of it. For Bond would be also, for example, martini, shaken, not stirred. It is a motif and it's a used storytelling device to actually show a specific state of the character and like the the class of the character in a way. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's something that every time you see him drinking a martini, shaken, not stirred, you are back in the Bond movie. Even if there's just been a funny scene or or a, a crazy scene or something very, very dark has happened. Suddenly there's a martini, shaken, not stirred. 
that's a genre and tone and franchise in this case touch point you know exactly where you are and <laughs> that is what these themes and motifs should be so that you can bring your story back to where it should be back to that touchstone every time so it feels like one big story next one we have hellish world oh, and yeah. the foundation of Gil Bayoa. Uh, I'm Apologies sure, for pronunciation. I am pretty sure I have completely butchered that name. Do you want to go down a little bit because they can't see the text? Of course. So um, another fantastic world. The motivation in this one was great. So essentially his motivation was um, he has a main world, but he wanted to create another space with a really different feel, sort of inspired, excuse me, by Legend of the Five Rings, sort of it's got that sort of uh, kung fu samurai story. Kung fu fighting. Sorry. So that's really great. He's made it really clear when he answers the questions. Again, beautiful, short, clear sentences. So the meaning doesn't get lost in all the words. It's very, very important. This is very important. Uh, we've seen it again and again today. And I would strongly suggest that, for example, you find words which are keywords and you literally make them bold. Because you can do that, yeah. when you see that, when you have to get out of it, for example, it should be refreshingly different. And exotic. And exotic, for example. Those are the sort of key words that you're you're looking at. And that's what you want to come back to. Because this is the place that you as a storyteller or as a writer of something, you will have to go back again and again. That's why I keep it very obvious and very easy to access this article. Say, am I doing this thing right? Or am I completely like botching what I'm writing right now? And this is where the foundation and the scene comes into play. That's what the answer to all of these questions is. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, yeah, so again, fantastic article, beautiful writing, excellent stuff. What we wanted to talk here about was the drama. So you folks will remember if you were with us yesterday, the drama is five points, five because it feels like lots to your players. Um, Effectively, that goes back to the psychological idea that uh, a person can follow up to three threads easily, but after the third and the fourth and the fifth thread, it starts to become more muddy and harder to continue to keep track. And that's what makes it interesting because Absolutely. you cannot track the whole world. You should never be able to track the whole world what's happening. Right. It should feel bigger than your players can technically understand. That's the dream. So... Um, this drama is supposed to be essentially current affairs. Now, as current affairs, they're not all bad. Some of them are good. If you want to look at our world right now, a little bit of a pandemic going on. But also, we've had a, a big um, a big space victory recently. That that could be something in the, in the drama as well. Um, positives, negatives, things that are happening in the world, current affairs. What we saw here was a little bit of a history drop. Yes. So it's stuff that had happened, not stuff that is happening now. Now, it's very easy when you're building these first documents to get excited about your world too early and get excited about the history too early and accidentally drop history when you're supposed to be dropping things that are happening. The and current affairs, effectively. Exactly. So you can see the first point is there was the first kingdom that bent the knee to this big empire. Um some say it was out of faith, some say it was uh, something else, but that happened. Unfortunately, that's not something you can use as current affairs. You could spin it on and saying, it was the first kingdom to fall, but there's going to be a revolution, or there's already a re revolution. It's brewing already, for example. Exactly. Yeah. That would be drama. And that's a very easy way to look at something that is static and put it into motion, which is all about what the drama is. It's the way to make your world feel alive. The other thing I wanted to mention here is, remember that your meta documents are for you, the game master. They're not for your players. They will never should be for your players. Exactly, your players should not see this stuff. So where in point three we have, what other secret does it hide? That would be perfect for a player document. As a game master document, write yourself a note. Because you should know what the secrets they hide, unless you haven't written just yet, which is also fine. But still, the the no there should be there are more secrets hidden here. Need to expand ASAP. That should be essentially the way you put it down there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that that was the other note that we had about the drama. Beautiful world created here. Absolutely, only in sentences, but so rich, so full. Beautiful work. Um. And uh, yeah, we just, just, just the drama, making sure that yeah. that feels like it's in motion and you're not writing from a player perspective, you're writing from a game master perspective. And also, once again, a very good example of a location, short to the point, 
clear exactly what it's supposed to be in terms of size. Yeah. Next one is Farlia. World Farlia. Yes. And we wanted to, in fact, talk a little bit about this, not because of the scope, because in fact it was written quite fine. The scope yeah. and the and and the scene was written quite nicely. The problem came here. Right. So the foundation of this author was great. The se scene setting was great. And actually in the foundation, which I, I was going to show you, which means just, just shut the tab, doesn't matter, off, doesn't matter. Um, the hook looked a little bit like, ha, huh, it's a bit margarine. So the hook is drinkable water has become a very limited resource. Now I would say that is not a hook to get your players to the table. So if I say to my players, drinkable water has become a very limited resource, they will not want to play in this world. It's, there's nothing there that's making yeah, me excited. It's not negativity. Is that is the, there is nothing excited about exciting right. about it? Um, so including in your hook something that will get your players excited, like something from the ele elevator pitch, the thing you'd put in the movie trailer. That is a good thing to put in the hook. Explosions, cars, <laughs> more cars. In a world where drinkable water has become a limited resource, they use cars. You kind of kind of kind of bombed me there so the point is in this world where this has happened so and so and so and so um in this world where this has happened empires control uh the water and every drop is life that's a hook um every day is 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 struggling to survive now the um the foundation actually expanded this into something super, super interesting. They made this really cool post-apocalyptic world. From, from So from this hook that didn't look very promising, they built out something really beautiful. And then we got to the geographic location. You'll remember, guys, that the, the uh, homework said, build a location that epitomizes your foundation and setting the scene, which you can use in session one. Now, if you're using it in session one, you know your players are going there. As we've said, you need an allowed, a sentence, and a paragraph. If your players get to an oasis in a desert with some sandworms and Trixie Fay, they're going to have questions, they're going to want to do stuff, they're going to want to interact with the world, and so you need a little bit more about the kinds of people you might find there, or no people, kinds of effects that might be there, a little bit of, um, of an allowed, so something that keys into the senses, so you can like get them immersed in this in the space. Again, and allowed a sentence, a paragraph. This is just a little bit too little for somewhere that you know your players are going to go. A little bit more detail, it's going to make it a lot more immersive. And as a contrapoint, we go to the next one. Yeah. Which, just to be clear, it was very interesting. It was a very interesting Again, concept. Lovely world building, super interesting, beautiful layout here. Very nicely done. Indeed. But this is not a foundation. No. Because this is so prosaic and he has so much information. You don't mean prosaic, you mean full of prose. Full of prose, yeah. yes. Proseful. Proseful. Proseful, apparently. Uh, that makes it very hard to uh, navigate for yourself because this is an art, uh, a document for yourself. And also, it does not focus on giving you the information, but it's focusing to being beautiful. And that is a mistake for this type of article. Absolutely. So, this looks to me more like a primer. Like we were talking about that you would give to your players after session zero, then it looks like a foundation document. My 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 notes for talking about this are more words is not more better. So what I mean is essentially your meaning gets lost when you add too many words. What you want is very lean sentences that have evocative hooks to come off. Not lots and lots of sentences, very lean sentences, just little bits as we said before, single sentences, so that when you go back to it, you get to the core of what your world is about. You don't have to go back and think, oh yeah, I need to refocus, and then read a whole page that takes you off, you know, on, on a lot of tangents. You want very clean core sentences. And once again, it was a beautiful article. Beautiful work. But it, yeah. it lacked the ability of being a foundation article or a scene article. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and as we say, it's going towards a primer, but um, yeah, for the meta stuff, Keep it lean, it will help you, and that will help you future-proof your world, essentially. Yes. So that again, was... Yeah, uh, again, again, as we said before, the scene. Also beautiful, also not the scene. That's the issue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, But I the location was perfect. It was exactly what it was supposed to be. I mean, it might be a little bit bigger, a little but, bit big, but, but still... Honestly, honestly, it's not. If you look at it, it's a yeah. couple of paragraphs. It's longer than I would write. 
but it's not massive. There's a beautiful um, uh, allowed at the top. And again, what what this author has done in the allowed is that they've really played on the immersive qualities. They've played on the senses. They've played on the drama of the world to make it very exciting. That's what the allowed is for. And then they've added some key information. So uh, yeah, really, really nice work there. Next one, we have... The Foundation of Weirdland. Exactly. What do we have to say about this, Richard? Foundation of Weirdland. Adventure Hook versus World Hook. Yes. So the hook here is a plot hook. The island of Weirdland suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Players need to find out why it appeared and what is there. What is the story of the island? Now, that is the story of the campaign. That is the plot of the campaign. But it is not the hook into world. It is into the world. It is not in this world. Aliens ride dinosaurs in a constant battle for the banana resources. That is the story of the world. That is that is the come play in my world. You're going to be in an alien riding a, a dinosaur. So although it is great, and it's an awesome adventure hook, it is not a campaign setting hook, and it doesn't tell you what the world is about. It tells you what the campaign is going to be about. Exactly. You should effectively restructure that. Because there are obvious tones of exploration, yeah, and that's what the players should know. Like effectively, the players should know that this is a world ready for you to discover its secrets. Exactly, this is a world that is three hundred kilometers long, but it's full of wonder. This is a world in which islands can appear and disappear. Yep, that's amazing. That's amazing. It's a world yeah. in which the geography changes overnight. Oh my god, I want to play there. It, funnily enough, it doesn't need those specifics. It just needs the kernel of the mystery of the hook, essentially. And that is going to help you a lot. The other thing we wanted to talk about with this is character agency. So agile world building um, does have this thing about player experience, which is very, very important. has the world feel. And then it has this question of character agency. So in our example, we um, in our the little anvil advice that we wrote, essentially the characters can either change the world a huge amount, and that change might be very long lasting, or they can change only small aspects of the world, and that change might be very fleeting. But they can always change the world a little bit, at least, because that gives players power. Oh. That means they're interacting with the world building and changing the world. That is what brings them to the table. So with this example, um, the characters have to tiptoe around the world there's little they can change. There's a lot they can find out that leads to more knowledge about the background of the current campaign and the cosmology of the game setting. It all sounds awesome. My worry is that it sounds like the players will observe the world building rather than interacting with the world building. Now, I don't know how you play your game. That might be a phrasing thing. I don't know. But that would be my worry. It's with a this consideration. Statement. We should exactly, take in, yeah. absolutely. Because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you are creating a tabletop RPG campaign, not writing a book. Um, your players have to be able to interact with your world. So, um, so give them some agency because that will bring them back. Very true. Very and true. that will also give them consequences so that they don't turn into murder hobos. Again, that's more guy space, but um, yeah, absolutely. Again, the ravine, this is the article for this world. Yeah. It's not the biggest article you could have. I think it's missing some information here. So think about how people will experience it because honestly, it looks like a very cool location, but it will not be enough for you when you go into the session to A, explain to your players and B, not having to rush and create things on the spot. Because at the end of the game, that is the question. How many of the things that you have created you need to create on the spot and for how many of those things you were ready. Yeah. The more things that you leave in luck or to be created on the spot, the more slow your game will be and the more time it will take for you to in fact communicate with your players and do what you're supposed to be doing which is actually promoting the world and role playing with them. The other thing that I want to bring up with this article is that dichotomy between flavor and fact. So this article is great. It's got a lot of facts but you don't want to read this out to your players, right? You're, if you read out the, the dimensions and the specifics and all of this stuff, your players are going to zone out. 
So that's the power of the allowed. And that's why I suggested that you include an allowed, because what you do is when they appear in your in this big ravine, you give them this flavor text, you create bustle and noise of the cranes and the scream of a slave because the slaves in this world, you create the, um, the echo of this ravine because it's 50 kilometers long and five kilometers wide. You don't give them the facts, you give them the experience and that is where the allowed comes in. So I would say always, if you can add an allowed and if you don't want to full on add an allowed, add sensory details of how this world, how this space feels, because that is the immersion, that is the game master bit, rather than the um, sort of just world building bit, essentially. True. Where are we going? We're yes. going here. Ooh, it glows. It glows indeed. This is uh, Milior, the world of TJ. Yeah. Because, I mean, I'm saying it because it kind of is written there. So says that? TJ has done something very unique and something very special because DJ is not writing for himself as a storyteller. Yeah. DJ is planning to create a world which is going to be in fact a world that others will play in. And which that's effectively, part of his motivation. Yeah. Exactly. Which means in many ways that the meta of the world become part of the introduction of the world because they are supposed to be read by other storytellers. And that is a very unique approach, a very interesting approach. We have many people who are in fact creating um, uh, um, how do you call them campaign settings in World Anvil, and this is the way you will do it if you're building from somebody else. This is probably the only chance that you will have to have a meta publicly visible and that you do not care if the players do it or not. So uh, TJ did some excellent work with this. Uh, we did have some notes and it goes about, in fact, expansion, is that correct? And necessarily how how open this was in terms of the motivation. Right, we want to talk about motivation because um, it's great to have a project that ticks a lot of boxes for you, but make sure that in your motivation, as we said before, when we were talking about motivation, that it's, some, it's something that you are passionate about. There is that key to the passion of something in the world building. So here we have, I'm building the world of Mel Melior for fun, but that doesn't say why this world, as an example of what World Anvil can do, because World Anvil is awesome but that doesn't say why this world. So all of these motivations, they are great motivations to have, but they're not motivations why I'm building the world of Melior. They could be a motivation why I'm building the world of Catfoot Sundays. What is wrong with you today? I'm quite tired, <laughs> quite tired people. Um, so, so having the motivation tied specifically to the project is really important because that's the thing that's going to keep you going back. That's the thing that you look at and you're like, oh yeah, that's why I'm not starting a new project. That's why I want to keep working on this one. So that's what I want to say about motivations. Um, Try to give them more focused. Yeah, exactly. Can you pop over to the uh, location on this one? Yes, having said that, I was about to exactly tell you. You, you broke my introduction. Oh, my sweet So theme. having said that. Oh, look at that map. TJ submitted the anvil, which is a beautiful island that looks like an anvil which was indeed a very beautiful article. I mean, you wouldn't expect less from TJ, to be fair. He's, uh, He's pretty an much a veteran and an artist. Uh, beautiful article, a lot of information, beautiful imagery, a lot of information. So <laughs> and, much information. And that was actually what we want to talk about. This article is probably the article you should have if Anvil is the location your players play in. This is the primary location. And this is like, three or four sessions in your campaign. Absolutely. So um, imagine if Anvil is Corvair, right? And your, your, your players are spending session after session after session in Anvil, then you will have this amount of information because after each session, you are building a paragraph. You are building a paragraph. You are building a paragraph. This is a wonderful example here. There's four titles here, each of which has more than one paragraph. Now, I would say the first iteration of this article should be one sentence for each of those. Pretty one sentence on diverse climate. This, this, probably this. And exactly. Part of that, essentially. Exactly. Now, there's nothing wrong with building more, but remember that is taking time away from you. That is taking time away from other considerations. And your players will not necessarily read it because we all know that players are notoriously bad at actually reading stuff that we give them. It's okay, we love them. But um, yeah, so just bear in mind that you are sticking to a paragraph and then a paragraph and then a paragraph. Um, you don't wanna get lost. And as we said before, right at the beginning, 
if you build too much before your players are there, it's always a temptation to railroad. You want to shove them towards this thing that you spent time on. You made it beautiful. You want them to go there. And railroading is something that we try and avoid as game masters. So that is the argument for not building too much. Very Having said funny. it, if you really want to do it, you really love it. You Go should it. do it, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Well, but again, it's fun. Let's not forget that this is this talk is not about goal building. This talk is about agile creating goal agile yeah. goal building for game masters that do not have enough time and they want to have something that will be more visible, yeah. approachable, and easy for them and their players. Absolutely. World building themselves, I can lose myself writing articles for days unending, which is yeah. perfectly fine. Um I yeah, yeah. The time. but it's about not getting lost in those details. That's that's where we're going with all of this. That is it, that's the motto of agile world building, building what you need when you need it. So uh yeah, that's what we have to say about that. So now we're ending into very special kind of um teachers pets. Teachers pets. Teachers pets. Well, we didn't know them uh, to be fair, but the next world we're going to be discussing is from Dark Hobbit. Dark Hobbit. Um which is called Winroll, and I love that. Cover we have story. to say That's that a verti cover, isn't it, it is a verti cover indeed. Um, so Beautiful. it was very hard for us to find something to say about this article, uh, this uh, piece of work, in the next one. Right, we were looking through. And we were like, "What can we talk about? Can, can we talk about anything in this? Can we just like can we just make happy noises as we look at it?" We can say it happy was world building noises. An excellent piece of work. Fantastic! If you look just visually looking through here. You can see that you know it's always a sentence, two or three sentences, beautifully brief, beautifully evocative. The drama was faultless, really beautifully done. We found one thing wrong with it. Hop to the um, location. Location. Give me a second. Where's my mouse? It's here. I it's lost here. my mouse. It here. Oh, here it is. Yeah, you found. Sorry, I found it's it. good. So the only thing I would say is the allowed. That's the only thing I wanted to talk about. And as I've mentioned today already, your allowed should be the evocative flavor text. Emphasis on flavor. This is the space to dig into your five sentences. This is the space to put your world building in motion and send it into the senses of your player characters. This is the place to build the wonder. This is where all your adjectives go, people. <laughs> This is where things smell and clang and shudder and quiver and crackle. This is where the magic happens. The danger, the, the problem with this allowed, and again, it was the only problem we could find in this whole submission, is that it is very nice, but it is actually introduction text. It is yes. not allowed text. It's not text. allowed text. It's not flavor text. So you can, what you can do is you copy that, put it down there, and write us a, a new allowed text, essentially. Exactly. That would be perfectly fine as well. Absolutely. And that is the only thing we had to say about this, is make sure when you are writing allowed texts, they are wonderfully evocative, and they, they make your players go, ooh. To X cross, the second one. Allowed. Like, allowed, allowed. Yeah. Kind of thing, yes. Not permitted, but noisy. Exactly. So we got to the last one, yeah. which was, in fact, the exemplar of how you should be doing things. Right, we might start using this one as our example instead of our own, yes. my God. Um, this is from Davina, who is a very accomplished world builder. Again, you can see just visually, the motivation is fantastic. I want to create a stunning, interesting campaign world and space uh, and spice it with my love for the Victorian age. So that right there is why this world and how this world, right? All of that in the motivation for this world. And that's what we've been talking about a lot with motivations. It's not just why world build, it's why world build this project. Yes. So you can see again, as you go down, single sentence, um, beautifully brief, absolutely stunningly uh, uh, unpacked, really, really lovely Beautifully recurring things. Like yes. Very short, very quick and very simple and also very easy to uh, reproduce within session. Yeah, totally. So um, as we said, those re reoccurring themes are storytelling motifs. And these are very easy things to set any scene, to bring in, to end a scene. A lovely way to end a scene is, um, uh, and as you walk away, you look over your shoulder and see insert motif here, or and you hear insert motif here. And those are all things that you can just go snoop and slot them into a, into a session wherever you need them, at the beginning, at the end, as, as a pause. Again, in the rules of the world, beautiful structure simple and to the point throughout yeah. everything 
Uh, I would have to say that the CSS has to do something with it because uh, Davina has done a great work to make sure that the um, uh, headers are way very well organized in terms of the height they take and the size they have and the text is very clearly to read which makes readability much higher yeah which makes it much easier for anybody especially you when you're ready to find what you're looking for exactly because the point of these documents of course they're not going to be shown to your players they're not going to be shown to anyone else they're going to be shown to you when you're like wait what was i doing what is this project oh yeah no i've i've been reading a book about plants and now suddenly i need to get back to my world what was i doing this is this is where you can very quickly scan down the document and be like, oh yeah. And finally, the location, the twisted forest. You can see here that Davina didn't note more than essentially two paragraphs here. There is a good allowed that you can read to your players to get them introduced to that. And there is also a beautiful image to yeah. add a little bit of flavor and to add a little bit of uh, the visualization because you see this forest and you say, yeah, okay, that's a forest that everything hit the fun. I wouldn't say what. Yeah, exactly. And and, and it, that's what you want to know about, effectively. And finally, what I wanted to say on this is that um, as we as we were talking about, Davina has taken her foundation, she has set her scene, and she's created for session one, which is what we've been talking about, a location which absolutely epitomizes the genre, the tone, the details of her world. It's um, It's got those horror elements, blood, twisted branches, like long bony fingers. It's so evocative. It really sets the scene. You shove your players there in session one and they go, okay, I know what this campaign is going to be about. And that is, that's the beauty, all right? That's what we want from all of this, that you're really making it as evocative, as exciting as you possibly can. I would like to say congratulations to everyone who submitted because your work was amazing. Your work was very good. And I hope that it taught you more about your world. Please do not be afraid to keep these articles and to uh, consult them because they will help you. There will be a time very soon that you will be able to put those in a template with more information for myself and Janet in order to write them into your world. And there will be videos from Janet, I'm guessing, as well. Yeah. Hopefully, if all goes well, next time we go on holidays, we'll be writing a book about it yeah Would you guys not... asked us for an agile world building book and we, we thought we think maybe we could do it and also we thought you know what it might be a good day to do something that is not well done will yeah. and we do it together which we do not do much yeah, of exactly. that. so <laughs> yes <laughs> So, so uh, somebody asked by the way about the participation trophy and we said it before but i will say it once again if you submit anything within today you will be eligible for the participation trophy of Walt Dunville that DJ, you have to design very soon, by the way, yes. because I haven't told you about that and we haven't thought about that until yesterday. So yes, DJ, put it on your list now. Yeah, absolutely. So if you submit by the end of today's stream, you will be uh, you'll be able to get a digital badge on your World Anvil profile. So we'll have your email, we'll know your, your um, thing and we'll just pop that in there for you. Uh, we have just a few more minutes. Do we have any last questions? Oh, uh, well, if we have, we can check it there. Is there a way to store, plan, and counters in Goldanville? Well, plot articles is the way you do that in Goldanville. Um, it's not a matter of organizing the, um, the encounter in terms of, for example, your initiative, but a plot article is made as a short story, for example, that you can write your uh, start blocks and you can write the encounters, or you can write about, for example, the um, you, you can write traps or events that's going to happen or the triggered events or items they will find. So yes, in many ways, plot articles can be used to That's how encounters. I use them. So when I write a plot article, I, um, I write a big plot article for my campaign, and then I write small plot articles for each session. And in that session, I will write pretty much the hook some seeds I want to drop. I'll um, embed the stat blocks of the encounters that I'm going to run. And I also, if I'm going to do traps, if I'm going to have uh, in, <laughs> in that campaign I ran for you, um, I, um, I had a tentacle come out a mirror and grab him. So I, <laughs> I wrote in the grappling rules because I knew I would forget the grappling rules. So I just copy pasted the grappling rules so I could remember them. So that when I was running the campaign, I just could have the plot article open and be like, yeah, you're grappled now. And I know exactly what to do what to do with that because I got the stuff in front of me. Ha. Yes. You were grappled. Um, another question that came just now it was if the things that people will be submitting today will be uh, reviewed. The answer to this is this. 
we have received a lot of articles, like a lot of articles, and we would like to go back to our community and in fact, give you some feedback. So we will be arranging some sort of a workshop in the days to come that we will go through some of more of those articles. Absolutely. In, yeah. So yes, there is a good chance that we'll be checking it out. Yeah, totally. Lots and lots of excitement for the vampire cow. Um, I think that's what they want on their badge, you know? Vampire cow. I can vampire see that. Cow. I can see that, yeah. So another question. I've gotten a lot of listening uh, to all of this, but are you going to have a template for a quick goal that can we can access? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, there will be a way for a, we will be sitting down effectively and we'll show you some of the um, information we have just shared with you. We'll create a little bit of a workbook out of this that will be sent out to you by the email that you have submitted when you registered for uh, uh, cow. cow and cow. Yes, cow. Mm. So there will be some information that will be coming back to you in terms of like notes from the talks uh, as more like points, right? Yeah. Will not the whole expanded thing, but points. But we really try to mash a lot of information in one place right now. For every single thing that we discussed today, we probably can do one or two talks yeah. separately. We know because we have done that in the past and it was amazing, but it takes also several days to do. So yes, is the answer to that very quickly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, to create worlds or locations, I do a lot of statistics. Can you add, uh, calculate the statistics into an article? So you can add statistics absolutely easily. You can pop those into the sidebar. That's a great place to put them, particularly like if you're doing uh, demographics and this kind of stuff. Um, we have coming soon, pie charts, bar charts, some of those snazzy things. So you'll be able to create those in World Anvil and then embed those into your articles. Into your articles, well. exactly. So um, yeah, it's a feature that's coming. It's something that a lot of folks requested. So that will be that will be coming in this next big cycle. And it's on the roadmap. If you want to check that out, you can find that on our blog, which is blog.worldanvil.com. Catherine asks, would you email when a submission is going to be released so we can watch online? Uh, we will be definitely giving announcements on the website and on Discord and about on an media. upcoming event like that and social media yes so yeah if you follow us on social media if you join our discord you'll see all of those announcements we don't want to bother you with thousands of emails uh we put all of our stuff out on social media so just just follow us and you'll see it easy peasy easy peasy yes i think that we're there and i think that guy will appreciate and you probably will appreciate after two hours that you're going to have a bio break a little bit longer if that's the case oh yeah so guys thank you so very much for being here with us i really hope you have enjoyed it i really hope you've learned something new we are on Discord and we are available to talk to you if you have any questions. There is a channel in our Discord called Cow Convention that you can go there and talk to us and ask questions as supplementary or anything like that. We will be happy to answer them as much as we can. Thank you so very much for your time. I just want to add that um, we go live five times a week uh, talking about game mastering, world building, all of that stuff. And as I mentioned before, we have a webinar every Tuesday at seven o'clock uh, London time, which is... 11 a.m. Pacific time, I think. No, yes, yes, 11 a.m. Pacific time. I can subtract <laughs> eight whilst live. Um, so uh, yeah, if you have follow-up questions, if you asked a question that we sadly couldn't answer today because the chat's been going like this, then uh, you can come join us on one of those streams. I also do uh, rating streams. We do lots of other bits and bobs. Um, yeah, so we, we absolutely hope that this has been helpful. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, on with the next. Grab your hammer and, and go, go, go build. build. Bye bye, guys. <laughs>